Welcome to Eel Talks in the Anikinish Watershed. Today's presentation is all about American eel, Godot and Mi'kmaq, and the Anikinish Watershed, and the work that is being done to ensure that eel are present in the watershed, that eel passage is not blocked throughout the watershed, and habitat restoration work to benefit eel. I want to begin today with acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded and current territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Godot are an important aquatic species to the Mi'kmaq people and their way of life. They have a deep relationship with harvesting eels for thousands of years. Eels are an important source of food as they are rich in nutrition and provide medicinal properties as well. Eel skins have been used as braces and bandages. Juniper balsam and eel skin were used to make a poultice for sprains as well. All parts of an eel are used when harvested. Eels have many spiritual qualities as it is frequently found in legends and regularly used as ceremonial offering. The Anikinish watershed is rich in harbors, ravine, and estuarine habitats that support the American eel life cycle. The Mi'kmaq have a long history and connection with har harvesting American eel and other fish. Protecting this habitat is extremely important to the Mi'kmaq Nation to ensure that eel continues to prosper and to provide the Mi'kmaq with food and medicinal healings for future generations. Today, we are hoping the information and conversations will help guide the work we are doing for eels. Welcome to our workshop and information session. Today on Eel Talks, we have three different groups presenting on their work with American Eel and the Anaganish Watershed. My name is Victoria Maxwell. I'm a field technician with the Nature Legacy Project. I work in the Department of Aquatic Resources and Fisheries Management, DARFA, which is a program administrated by the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq, or CMM. CMM is a tribal council that provides services to all eight Mi'kmaq communities within the mainland of Nova Scotia. We also have the Nova Scotia Salmon Association presenting. They're a leader and a leading volunteer organization promoting the wise management and conservation of our wild Atlantic stocks and trout stocks. And finally, we have ACROM presenting as well. And ACROM is an international infrastructure consulting firm delivering professional services throughout the project's life cycle, from planning, design, and engineering to programming and construction management. We thank them for being here today and sharing their knowledge with us. To start the presentation, we're going to start with myself, Victoria Maxwell, from the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. The species at risk watershed assessment and management of culturally significant fish Species through a two-eyed seeing approach within Mi'kma'ki mainland Nova Scotia is a project here at MCG that was funded by the Canada Nature Fund for Aquatic Species at Risk, or as we like to call it, Nature Legacy Fund to keep it short. This is a multi-year and multi-watershed project which started in 2019 and will run into 2023 and we'll be covering the St. Croix Watershed, the Stuyak Watershed, and the Southern Gulf of St. Lawrence Watershed. The Anikinish Watershed is part of the Southern Gulf of St. Lawrence Watershed portion of the project. The goal of the Southern Gulf of St. Lawrence project is to identify the key habitat areas and limiting factors for brook floater, Atlantic salmon, and American eel. The Anikinish watershed portion is focused on American eel, Mi'kmaq ecological knowledge, MEK, relative abundance estimates, and aquatic connectivity concerns in the south and west rivers of the Anikinish watershed. American eel surveys were conducted in the south and west river this past fall by the method of eel pots and minnow traps that were zip tied together and baited with pork. The pots were set for one hour soaks and overnight soaks in the two rivers. Water quality data was taken at, si at sites using a YSI. In the West River, three sites were surveyed, but none of the sites were for potential barriers to eel passage. A dam has been identified in the West River and will be, be further reviewed. The eel pots were set for one hour, but no eels were present in the pots. 
Many other species were caught, including, including yellow perch, creek chub, white sucker, fall fish, red belly dace, and three spine stickleback. In the South River, three potential barriers to eel passage were identified the La Catrine Dam, the Fraser's Mills Hatchery Dam, and Pinevale Dam. In total, there were eight sites surveyed for American eel, with three of the sites were, were one hour soaks and five of the sites were overnight soaks. In total, we didn't catch any American eel, but we again caught many other species. And in this slide, we can see a white sucker here and then a thaw fish, which was very interesting to see. It was very shiny and bright. Fieldwork in the Anaganish watershed will continue this field season with continuing on identifying berries for eel passage in the South and West River. We're going to survey at least five sites to determine relative abundance, density, and species composition for American eel. And we're also going to collect basic water chemistry data at multiple sites. Some of the final work on our project will include a pit tagging system for American eel, and we're going to be modifying barriers to promote American eel passage. We would love to hear from you to help shape our Anaganish watershed project. We are seeking knowledge holder for Mi'kmaq knowledge interviews. You can contact myself or Alana Silvoy to participate. We're seeking information on areas of concern in the South and West River. So do you know where an area is being polluted? Do you know where an area has been degraded or an area that potentially has a barrier to eel passage? We are also seeking information on known eel habitats so that we can further protect those and kind of see where our American eel are in the, watersh in the watershed. Would you like to help out in our field season this spring and summer? Please feel free to reach out to myself or Alana to get involved. Thank you. We will now hear from the Nova Scotia Salmon Association. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nicholas McGinnis. So I'm a habitat restoration specialist with the Nova Scotia Salmon Association. And we're here today to discuss the Gulf Region Priority Rivers Project, which is a collaborative stewardship project between a number of stakeholder groups as well as rights holders groups. And it's an exciting project, and we're just going to present a quick overview of what we've been up to with this project. So our Gulf Region Priority Rivers project focuses on fish habitat within four watersheds in the Gulf Region of Nova Scotia. Two are in Antigonish County, which are the West and South River, and also in Cape Breton and Inverness County, we have the Mabu River watershed, as well as the Marguerite River. So this project has a lot of collaborating partners, and I've listed some of our core partners here on this slide. So in Cape Breton, we have the Marguerite Salmon Association and the Inverness, Inverness South Anglers Association, as well as the Unimaki Institute of Natural Resources. And on the Antigonish side of things, we have the Antigonish Rivers Association, as well as the Mi'kmaq Conservation Group. And... On top of all this, the Nova Scotia Salmon Association's adopt -a stream program is also involved, providing technical support and funding. And the adopt -a stream program has been involved in projects with the Button Keck Fisheries on a number of occasions. And in the past, we've actually partnered up with uh, adopt -a stream the Antigonish Rivers Association, and Button Keck Fisheries. Um, completing projects on both the Pomket River, the Black Avon River, and finally the Afton River. So we have four goals associated with this project. One is watershed conservation planning. So we hope through the course of this project to be able to complete stepwise restoration and watershed stewardship plans for each of the priority watersheds. We're also going to be supporting and conducting restoration works that are being undertaken by our project partners. And we hope to build capacity for the long term to enable our project partners to tackle larger scale projects. And this could be anything from um, providing essential equipment such as electrofishing units to uh, temperature probes, all the way to developing skills within an organization, whether that's their staff or their volunteers. 
And of course, throughout the whole project, we're going to be focusing on three species at risk, the Atlantic salmon, American eel, and Atlantic sturgeon. So like any multi-year project, um, this one contains a number of activities. And broadly speaking, we have broken the activities of this project into five categories, which begin with assessment, followed by characterization, which will involve um, GIS software, and which will characterize um, smaller units within each watershed known as spatial planning units. Um, building off of this is the third activity, which we will rank um, the spatial planning units based on the the habitat quality as it presently is, as well as the potential for restoration. And of course, during the, the life of this project, another activity will be the communication of what we're doing, as well as the results and our findings. And finally, we're going to actually do in-stream restoration on a number of rivers and streams within these priority watersheds. And there will be a focus on water quality improvement, as well as cold water innovation. So phase one of this project is the collaboration and planning stage, and that's where we're at today. So we've been doing some assessment, synthesizing existing data, building partnerships, and we're beginning to address um, existing habitat issues. Phase two of this project is the actual implementation. So we're going to take everything we found from our spatial planning units to our in-stream surveys to working with the communities and working with stakeholders. And we're actually going to complete um, projects that will have long lasting impacts and improvements for fish habitat. So opportunities for restoration, really we have to address some of the main threats. And in all of these priority watersheds, it seems that it has become quite a trend over the last number of years where our summertime conditions were experiencing very low base flows as well as very high water temperatures. So our restoration efforts really have to target these issues. So thank you to everybody for listening. And I ask that if you're interested in sharing some of your knowledge that you may have on the Priority Rivers that we discussed in this presentation, please get in touch. You can get in touch with us at nssalmon.ca slash golf survey, and we would love to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Our final presentation in Eel Talks is ACOM. Please enjoy their presentation. There's a slight pause in the video, but it will be on very shortly. Hello everyone, I'm Valérie Tremblay, Senior Fisheries Biologist working at ACOM. I've been involved with eels since my Master of Science. Afterwards, I've been also involved in the Canadian Eel Science Working Group and in the status report writing both in 2006 and 2012. Recently, we've been involved at ACOM with reconnecting the American eel habitats for different Indigenous groups in Quebec. Thus, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada has deployed funds on our Coastal Restoration Fund to establish the historical range of distribution of the American eel in the tributaries of the St. Lawrence hydrographic system. As you are deeply aware, the American eel is a long-lived species demonstrating a significant cultural and ecological value. The species has many usage in the indigenous community, not only fished for flesh, but have also been used for its medical, medicinal benefits using oil and skins, and skins, for example. Traditional fishing techniques have also been deployed for this unique species, such as spear fishing. The American eel shows a significant decline of abundance since the mid 80s, and its distribution range has been reduced through time with a direction of various obstructions such as dams or culverts. The American eel is a highly migrative species 
In fact, as after, after reproduction and hatching in the Sargasso Sea near the Bahamas, the larvae uses the oceanic currents to get back to the east coast of the US and Canada. Nova Scotia being the closest maritime province crossing its upstream migration towards the St. Lawrence hydro system. Arriving the coastal habitats, the American eel is called a glass eel. Pigmentation occurs rapidly though in the continental waters, switching to a elver. The juvenile stages are aiming for the fresh waters during the upstream migration and prefer a low velocity gradient, such as lakes with grass bed and loose substrate such as, such as mud. The yellow eel phase is the longest. It is considered as a growing phase for the species. In the maritimes, when there is a diversity of habitat, namely called a habitat complex, the yellow eel can also demonstrate seasonal migrations, either to benefit best growth conditions related to food acquisition, or at the end of the growing season, let's say, to access appropriate habitats for open wintering. Giving all the previous demonstration of the necessary migrations undertaken by eels throughout its life cycle, and specifically for the juvenile stages aiming the growing conditions of lacustrine habitats, providing safe passage in a watershed level is very important. When studying eels, the notion of obstacle clearance capacity is specific to the species, and therefore cannot be compared to salmonids. As you can see on the slide here, the swimming movements or, or undulation of an eel is very different from salmonid. Movements, swimming, or even sprinting performances facing an obstacle with high velocities is responding differently in terms of kinematics. The American eel shows no jumping capacity. Therefore, when addressing the capacity of eels to pass an obstacle, the species should be likely seen as a fish using reputation to climb. Reputation needs appropriate gripping surfaces, such as rocks covered of moss vegetation, or even a riprap allowing an intercali space where the air can pass. As eels can also breathe by its skins, at some point when alternative routes are available on the banks for a short distance, that may be the preferred path for addressing passage upstream of the obstacle. The Antigonish watershed here is known to be within the American eel current and historical distribution range. The Mi'kmaq Conservation Group has therefore requested our knowledge at ACOM and expertise uh, with uh, different groups, such as the, um, the groups uh, of uh, Mi'kmaq and Malasites from Gaspésie area to address the first steps of habitat restoration through providing safe passage to the American eel at different obstacles. The Mi'kmaq Conservation Group is now establishing sites where the eel presence was historically reported and abundance or presence greatly depleted nowadays with the construction of obstacles such as dam or culverts. The presence of beaver can even prevent eels from reaching preferred habitat upstreams. As a first step, habitat restoration should always be addressed from the downstream reaches as migration of juvenile occurs from the sea to the continental watersheds. Each and every drop at a culvert entrance should be also considered problematic to eel migration as they are impeding passage to eels. Effective restoration efforts need conceptualize the American eel behavior at obstacle and a great knowledge of the species capacity and attractive elements. Also, as explained earlier, eels needs an appropriate substrate to undertake migration through reptation movement. Here you can see some example of eel ladder substrate. Here, some different models. Um, where the animal perform reptation in the spaces of the plots using the margin of the plots to grip on. Although the Mi'kmaq Conservation Group project has yet to determine which sites will be remediated, three cases will now be addressed in terms of obstacle erected in the Antagonish watershed, namely the Fraser Mill Atri Dams, the Loch Katrin, and the Pineville Dam. These, these dams are all located in the South River. Similar restored habitat 
from previous studies on on, on ACOM's hand in 2011, uh, sorry, 2019 and 2020 for other First Nations group in Quebec will be presented presented as a similar restored habitat for each case. Loch Catherine here. Loch Catherine is a gravity concrete dam. This dam is composed of three perty overflow. A fish ladder is present at the dam. You can see it here. Um, and you can see also from the pictures uh, that the fish ladder system is not in operation at the water level since it's too low. And as the middle part, the middle part is, is completely open. In normal conditions of operation, the middle part is, uh, is closed and the water level upstream is higher, consequently providing enough water for appropriate fish ladder operations. The entrance of the fish ladder is submerged for fish, namely the salmons here, and is built to expose high velocities, not suitable though for the eel migration. So to provide passage appropriate for the American eel, we have here a similar restored habitat in Saint-Jacques, Quebec, done for the Hurons. Um, so this is a suggestion, the construction of a standard eel ladder under an aerial structure attached to the retaining wall of the dam. The eel ladder can be installed permanently. The design of this eel device requires consideration of an ideal position at the entrance of the pass so that the ladder is attractive to the eel. Besides the entrance, the component of the eel design are defined as follow. An infrastructure composed of aluminum, including the, the migration substrate for the crawling of the eel. So we can see it here and over there and here in sections, um, including a sole slope suitable for its ascent. A rest basin, we can see it here and here, um, and, a, and also a change of angle of the structure to adapt to the configuration of the dam. The infrastructure is supplied with water to, to create optimal conditions for migration as a feed flow, and also as an attraction flow at the entrance of the ladder. The feed flow is pumped into the eel ladder either by electric or solo system. The attraction flow is rather created either by gravity or even by electricity if it's feasible on site. The conveying pipe or fish pipe, you can see over here, and we can see it here, needs to be long enough and well positioned at the end of the dam to make sure that the eels won't return back immediately to the bottom of the dam. Here, the Fraser Mill Atri Dam. The Fraser Mill Atri Dam is a gravity concrete dam. This dam is composed of a conventional spillway with a fixed crest. This dam has a fish ladder system. You can see typically for salmon is again in terms of design and configuration. Based on the picture, the entrance of the fish ladder is not operational and there is no flow on the crest of the spillway. We see that the intake on the right shore, we see here the intake on the right shore upstream of the dam. So it's the picture on the left. As a similar restored habitat, if we can guarantee a flow on the crest of the spillway over here, we could put a system as in the photo on the left but the water flow condition are, stays dependent on, on site conditions. To bypass any overflow problem on the crest of the spillway and the salmon and fish pass, an independent area structure could also be uh, erected at the hydraulic level. Uh, as you can see, it's proposed here, pictures on the right over here. Pineville Dam, some pictures here. Um, so the Pineville Dam exists, com is composed of a culvert with inappropriate flow conditions, either by showing high velocity or showing a drop, preventing natural access by eels, right? So upstream of the, the Pineville Dam is composed of a standard fishway of successive basins and gates. A similar restored habitat for Pineville, it can be considered to install a completely standalone device without using the culvert or the fish pass. And it's being done for most likely parallel to the ex this existing infrastructure. The entrance must be positioned in an attractive place for the eel. 
the structure will have a flow feeding adjust to the level of the lake. This device could consist of a section buried to the right of the dam to reach the level of the lake. So those were all examples for research side. Hopefully you learned something and I can't wait to get uh, in the field to uh, make sure that we have some restoration in the Antigonish watershed. Thanks a lot. Thank you for watching Eel Talks in the Annie Ganesh Watershed. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to any of our presenters.